All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. How you doing? I hope you're doing well. I really do. All right, I'm not going to waste any time. We're going to get into this. So this is part three of my Stephen McDaniels coverage, the troll head himself. Today I wanted to talk about his crazy interview that he did and kind of just talk about when killers do interviews in general. TV interviews. And uh, I was thinking about, I think there's two types of people that do interviews after they commit murder. The first type is they're just appearing to be, they're trying to appear to be innocent. So they commit the murder and then right after the murder, they're forced to start doing the I'm innocent little monkey dance. So in their head, they're constantly filtering every decision with how would an innocent person look and as we know it's real hard to do the i'm innocent monkey dance and not look stupid and to be doing that dance and having a news crew point a giant camera and zoom in in your face is just makes for unbelievably crazy clips so like i said first type of person They just want to appear innocent. You know, that's like the Chris Watts up there going like, like uh, if someone has them and they're not safe, I just want everybody to come home. I just want everybody to be safe. You know, he's up there. And usually what happens too in these interviews is you end up doing way too you end up trying to push the narrative that you're going with way too much so in the mcdaniels one he's doing a lot of like i mean no one's seen her i mean i haven't seen her since saturday i mean yeah and he's doing this like i mean just acting weird and um the first type of people that are just trying to appear innocent and trying to get away with it they probably don't want to do the interview but in their head they're just thinking this you know I'm trying to appear innocent an innocent person would do this interview so therefore I'm going to do it so again I think Chris looks like he just does not want to be there just going like like I just want everybody to be safe (laughs) um and then the second type are the people that want to appear innocent, but also they're trying to insert themselves into the narrative as to be a part of their creation. I think a lot of the murderers, like serial killers and stuff, they they look at it as they're like painting a picture of this murder. You know, it's their creation, and they, I think, almost can't help themselves by not wanting to be a part of the official story. I think anything that gets into press, like if Steven got away with this murder, I think he, he would have sat there for the rest of his day, you know, looking at that clip of him being like, I mean, no one's seen her since Saturday. <laughs> and just being like, hey, 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 I got away with it. And again, he's pushing the narrative. Also, he's really pushing the narrative that him and Lauren were friends. A lot of this, like, yeah, we, you know, her friend group, we're, we don't know where she is. You know, we've been looking around. And he even starts talking about her family and how he met her family. And it's like, Jesus, Stiven, Stiven, come on, Stiven. Um, I think Stiven was living out this crazy sex murder killer fantasy and like I said just couldn't help himself seeing a news crew down there and just be like I need to be you know a part of this official um it's kind of like when killers send like a puzzle to the newspaper or something or try to get something published like send clues in or something I think they just want to be a part of their what they call their creation like I just want everyone to be safe okay so why it's insane to do an interview if you committed murder and it's very simple because your face and your body do strange things when you're pretending to do the monkey dance 
of being innocent. Like if you watch Chris, if you watch the Chris Watts one, there's times where he like closes his eyes weirdly for a while. The point is, is if you're going to lie that you didn't, if you're going to lie and try to convince everyone you didn't commit murder, it's probably a good idea not to let someone with a big camera zoom in and tape your face. All right? I think people like Chris that lie all the time think they're so good at it, but in reality, people that lie all the time, they think they're like getting it past everyone, and most of the time, everyone just knows you're a liar, but they don't care enough to call you out on it. It's just like, oh, all right, yeah, whatever you say, bud. But, and they're not like looking, usually, so say like if Chris Watts and I are friends and he's sitting there lying to me, you know, we're, I'm not making eye contact with him the whole lie, you know, looking at his face. I'm just like, oh, he's lying. Okay, I'll look down, I'll look over here. Okay, yeah, no problem, man, thanks. And that's the end of it. But with a camera zooming in on your face it's just your face and it's being taped for eternity and you're up there like i just want them to be safe and you know Steven's up there i don't know we'll get into it just going who could do something like this Steven cried too we'll get to it i'm getting there um so i was thinking even the best actors probably wouldn't nail a realistic interview after they just killed someone. And, you know, actors rehearse for hours. If an if Meryl Streep was doing a scene where she was crying about somebody that had been taken from her life, she would rehearse for a long time. And also probably not nail it on the first take. And also probably not nail it while in their head trying to get away with murder. I mean, it, the stakes are never higher for this acting, you know, live on camera. Their life's on the line. They're playing for keeps. And to get up there and to think you're just going to nail a perfect take while some news person, while not having any experience acting, is just, it shows you how delusional these killers are, that they just think they're smart, and they think how good of liars they are, and really it's just a troll head and a monkey boy sitting there going, no one's seen them, they're doing weird face stuff. Um, okay, then the second reason... Um, other than just to appear innocent or to put themselves into the story to do one of these interviews is they attempt to get their narrative in. So Chris Watts was rambling about how she could have left or how, you know, how she went on a play date and he doesn't know where she is. And Stiven, Stiven, his narrative that he was pushing was that over and over again that maybe she went running and someone snatched her. You know, she runs a lot and no one's seen her. So he was really pushing the, she was running and someone snatched her. But both Chris and Steven push it way too hard. You end up just saying too much. That's really, you end up saying too much and doing like weird stuff with your hand. Like Steven kept pointing back every time he lied and it's like, what is back there? No, nothing. You know, he's like, yeah, we were both law students and we can't find her. And she went running. And, you know, the whole time the people shooting the news are just like, yeah, show this guy has troll hair. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're trying to push the uh, narrative that is not them murdering the people and uh, usually end up looking like an idiot. Okay, so let's get into Stiven's actual actual interview. So he starts by saying no one's seen her about 45 times. Okay? 
One, how do you know that no one's seen her stiving? You haven't seen her, but maybe someone else has seen her stiving. Um, and he, you know, rambles about how good of a person she was and how personable she is. And what's funny is, it's like, Steven, they're going to talk to her friends. They're going to talk to her, her real friends, and they're going to say that she wasn't friends with Steven. They're going to say no one was really friends with Steven, but he's up there being like, she was as nice as can be. So lots of rambling that no one's seen her. Um, and... Um, the news people are like, is there anyone, does she have any en en enemies or does anyone want to hurt her? And Stiven's like, I mean, we don't know where she is. <laughs> that was his answer to, is there someone that would want to hurt her? And he's sitting there just with a troll head going, no one has seen her. I mean, I haven't seen her. I mean... She went running and maybe someone snatched her. He uses the word snatched like six times. Okay, and then he really hammers home the things that he has going for him in the case. So he really hammers home. He's like, yeah, I mean, her friends came over and had a key. So had a key. That's where they got in. They had a key. His friends came over and had a key, so there's no forced entry. I think he even says that, which I guess kind of makes sense because he's a lawyer, so everyone's going to think he's kind of trying to be a lawyer. But And then he goes out of his way to say the door was locked when everyone got here, being like, whoever, whatever happened, the door was locked. So there was no struggle, no forced entry, and the door was locked. And then we get to the infamous part where the news lady goes, you know, did you hear up that they found, uh, like, a body? And Stiven goes, body? I think I need to sit down. And he goes over and plops down. And I think a lot of people are going to disagree with me a lot on this. A lot of people think that that body and that the whole thing of going to sit down is genuine. I've watched it a bunch of times, and I don't think that it's genuine. I think that that's his bad acting. I can spot bad acting a mile away, okay? I did a I, I did a pilot for MTV, okay? I worked with MTV. I know bad acting, all right? And it's almost like, you know when one of those movies is so bad that it, it turns awesome? It's like Troll 2 is one, and then whatever the movie that the disaster artist is about. That's the type of acting as it looks like, like in the movie where the killer finds the body and... The, body can't you picture just like a whole s movie theater of like a cult bad b movie and the star goes body and everyone cheers yeah it's our favorite part here's why i don't think it was real because if anyone's not surprised that there's a body in the trash it's Steven. Steven put the body there um and sorry i got a text and so I, you know, he, of course, he's not, he's going to be the least surprised that there's a body in the trash because he just put a body in the trash. And I mean, I'm sure he's real bummed that they didn't find it, but I think that, I don't think that that news would make him actually need to sit down. I mean, he just dismembered a body with a saw in a bathtub a few days before. So someone that can pull that off doesn't need to sit down when they hear that there's a body. I think that he launched into pretending I'm innocent. That was his little monkey dance. Could be wrong. I'm just a dude on YouTube, you know? But I really think that that's his body, just his bad acting. 
And then is where the this is where the interview just goes into crazy land. It's just crazy after that whole body and then having to go sit down and after everything that he said already and he's already said, I mean, like 40 times, he comes back. He comes back and he starts a lie cry. We got a lie cry, people. Official lie cry. I didn't know how long it would take to stumble into another one, but if you haven't been following the channel, what a lie cry is, it's where you're lying, but also you're crying. The cry lie. Was it a cry lie or a lie cry? Doesn't matter. You're crying, but also you're lying. It's not a good place to be in. It really isn't. If if you find yourself lie crying, it's probably time to just take a deep breath and just start apologizing to everyone around you and just face the music. It's not a good place to be in. But we got to lie cry. And so it's just nuts that he comes back and is crying and going, Who would do this? Maybe if I heard something, I could have helped. It's like Stephen. Why are you crying? That's why I wanted to be the whole. That's why I wanted to say the whole time is Stephen. Stephen. The fuck are you crying for? Listen, I've had a. I I like my neighbors. I'll water their plants. I'll pet their cat and feed their dog while they're gone. I'll check their place. You know, but if my neighbors die, I'd just be like. Man, that sucks, you know? Dang, that is rough. I hope they went down fighting. You know, I I wouldn't cry. And he's sitting there going, who would do this? And it's again, the cops are going to talk to her friends, and they're going to be like, Stiven didn't really ever hang out with her. So, why is he crying? <laughs> it's like, maybe I could have helped. It's just like, what are you doing, Stephen? Go in your apartment and figure out how you're going to get rid of the key to her apartment and her underwear. You're sitting there lie crying. This might be too. I heard that the what, part of this interview was live. So people, this is big. This is a possible live cry lie. I, I don't know if that has ever been done before. Just a live cry lie. Um, anyway, ba ba ba. Yeah, he's going, who would do this? She's the nicest person that there is. And he rambles on. Oh, the, the most cringe part of the whole interview. He starts rambling on about her family. Like how he met him once. And just what a creep job, you know? Why would anyone do this? Maybe if I heard something, I could have helped. I said that a bunch of times. Uh, making it sound like... Yeah, he just was trying to make it sound like they're best friends. Like, you know, a lot of we, and I'm in her friend group. And um, I was thinking, before I even watched the interview last night, is... I don't know, after doing Russell... Williams and now him I think if you're a female and you live alone you got to get yourself a dog you know get yourself a 50 pound you know 50 60 pound dog that's gonna bark if it hears a noise and you're good it's worth it you know that's what we that's what us humans have used dogs for for hundreds and hundreds of years of just like all right Fido we're going to bed so if, you, if a bear comes or if something scary comes out of the woods, you bark like hell and let us know and we'll come out with, you know, we'll come out with weapons and save the day. But your job is to let us know. And the dog's like, yeah, yeah, they love it. Um, I can't help but think if Stiven started coming through that door and a, and a 50 pound dog barked a few times, I think the door would have just closed and locked and he would have been out of there. And stay, same with Russell. You know, and then, so I'm thinking about that, 
just be like, God, I'm getting my daughter, if I ever had one, a dog. And get it, get it like, you, if you don't feel like raising a puppy, get a 75 to 7-year-old dog. They'll be totally trained. All they'll want to do is sit there and just guard you, basically. Um, so I was thinking about that, and then I started watching the interview, and he actually tells a story about how Lauren had a dog and it got hit by a car. And I was like, Damn. So he even knew that she, she, he even knew that she wouldn't have had a dog that was gonna bark. And I was like, living next to a, a troll face for that long, it's just nothing good is gonna happen from that. Um. Okay, where am I? Oh yeah, he tried to insert her boyfriend. They were like, "Do they have a boyfriend?" And he's like. He's like crying, like, and then um, he immediately stops crying. It's like, yeah, she has a boyfriend in Atlanta, and we're trying to talk, see if he's seen her. Just trying to, you know, get everybody looking everywhere else. Mentioned she thought, oh yeah, you know, just a terrifying part that to me shows that this wasn't just to appear to be innocent. That he wanted. He wanted to, you know, get over on all of us and to be like, I did the interview. He's like rambling and cry lying about how someone she has she had told her friends that she had thought that someone had been in her apartment, which it's obviously Stiven. And he's like, like, I wish I would have lent her a handgun that I have for protection. It's like the only the only troll hair that she needs protection from is you. So put your gun down and just keep your hands to yourself, porn boy. And then he has this line that's like, if she's scared in her apartment, then get her out of the apartment. And it's like, yeah. Yes, Stiven. That's what we all wish would have happened. And then I had forgotten this until... Um. I watched the interview, but this, he killed her the la the day before she was going to move out. So I think that supports my theory that he didn't want to lose her and he didn't want anyone else to have her and he wanted kind of their stories to be married for the rest of time. And this was the only way to do it. And I think he freaked out and was living this crazy murderer, lawyer, I'm going to get away with the perfect murder fantasy. And it's just it's just tough to do that. Um, yeah, so that's all I got. That interview is just crazy. It's just, I can't imagine, I can't even believe that it exists. Um, him crying and saying that if he heard something, he could have helped. It's just mind-blowing that he did it. One last thing that I wanted to talk about in this video. Someone had left a comment, or there's been a couple comments, saying that the way that he dismembered the body with the saw is going to leave so much blood splatter and so much just material that's going to be impossible to clean up that that alone is going to be almost impossible to get you know, to get away with the murder. And that was one of the most, you know, they're looking around her apartment that there's no forced entry and no anything. They haven't found her body yet. So they're like, I don't know, is this even a crime? And then it was finally seeing the bathtub where it just looks like a bloodbath where they are like, all right, you know, something grisly happened. But it reminded me, someone was like, you know, how would you dismember a body like that? and think you're going to get away with it. And it reminded me of a case in 2000. I think my UK people will remember this case. Uh, it's Lucy Blackman, who was a pretty blonde woman with long blonde hair, uh, was having money trouble in the UK, and she learned that you could go, if you're a pretty blonde girl you can go to japan and make a bunch of money being a hostess so it's not like a prostitute but you work in a hostess club and rich japanese men pay to sort of just hang out with you to flirt with you 
and you know, I'm not going to get into it, but Lucy ends up dead, and the same thing is this crazy rich Japanese guy cuts her up with the same type of saw, right? Dismembers her with the same type of saw. And in Japan, they have very little violent crime, and the crime that they do have is just part of the culture that the person admits it immediately. There, It's just no one... It's not like America where everybody tries to weasel out of it and there's a lot of cunning, you know, it's just like everybody admits it. So the Japanese police were not ready for a cunning, rich murderer that wasn't going to admit to it. And so this just turns into the whole trial and everything turns into this giant fiasco, right? And the defense team is arguing that there's no way that you could dismember a body in an apartment and not have any blood and splatter or anything because they're, the prosecution's arguing that he cut her up in, her, in his apartment, but there's no splatter or anything. And what's crazy is the prosecution figured out that he had bought in a bunch of camping supplies like a few days prior to when they think that he dismembered the body so the prosecution team went and bought the same tent that he bought and they bought a dead pig <laughs> just this is crazy and they filled the dead pig because a dead pig like they take all the fluids out they fill the dead pig with water with red food coloring or something red and they bring it into the tent zip up the tent dismiss the fucking lawyers dismember this pig inside the tent and prove that it's possible to cut to dismember a body inside a tent and not have the blood get out into the apartment isn't that crazy there's a whole book about it i'll probably do a video on the story there's a book about it a really long like if you can get past the really dry first chunk it's a really good book but it's called the people who eat darkness and it's just about this insane lucy blackman case if you're from uk and you actually remember that case let me know i would be very interested but anyway that wraps up the video for today uh with Steven. thanks for subscribing everybody i love you all true crime loser out